Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Matriarch Illuminations. This is the third event in a five-part series hosted by Jessica Wood. My name is Tasha Carruthers, and I'm a master's student at UBC School of Public Policy and Global Affairs, and I'm looking forward to learning with all of you tonight. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Musqueam Nation, whose traditional unceded territory I join this evening's virtual gathering from. As a settler, I'm an uninvited guest in today's Vancouver. Since we're on a virtual platform, I'd like to invite each of you to reflect upon the Indigenous lands that you are on today, wherever that may be. I also acknowledge that the Musqueam people host the University of British Columbia's Vancouver campus that has brought us together this evening for this very important conversation. I reflect on the deep and complex relationship that Indigenous peoples have fostered with this land, these waters, and other local beings since time immemorial. Before continuing, I would like to mention two housekeeping notes. The first is that this webinar is being recorded. And second, uh, later on, we're gonna be taking audience questions. So you're welcome to add your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, uh, but please don't use the chat box. I would like now to introduce you to the creator of this dynamic series, Jessica Wood. Jessica Wood is known as Sisit Yooks, meaning woman who creates change. She's a policy practitioner fellow at our School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. Jessica is from the Gitsan and Simshan nations with extended roots with the Taltan and Niska nations. She's currently serving as the Assistant Deputy Minister for the Reconciliation, Transformation and Strategies Division with the Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation for the province of BC although she is not in that role tonight, just to be clear. Jessica is leading BC's cross-ministry work to adopt and implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's call to action, and learnings from relevant case law, such as the Chilcotin decision. Tonight's theme is storytelling as guidance, and it's my pleasure to also introduce our special guest, Tanya Talega, an Anishinaabe journalist and speaker. For more than 20 years, she was the journalist at the Toronto Star, covering everything from health and education to investigations and Queen's Park. She's been nominated five times for the Michener Award in Public Service Journalism and has been part of teams that won the two National Newspaper Awards for Project of the Year. She also hosts the podcast Seven Truths, available on Audible. Tanya heads up the Makwa Creative Inc., a production company focused on amplifying Indigenous voices through documentary films, TV, and podcasts. And she holds an honorary doctorate from Lakehead University in Thunder Bay. It is now my honor to turn it over to Jessica Wood and have the opportunity to listen and learn with you this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Tasha. Appreciate the warm introduction. MSI CC Yokes, DYU. I'm honored to join you this evening from the territory of the Cowichan, Shimanus, and Masonic First Nations here on Salt Spring Island, and to introduce you to an inspiration. Um, Tanya is got to be one of the most powerful storytellers of our time and i'm honored to share this space with her and welcome you into a conversation that i think we would probably be most comfortable having over a mug of tea together in real time if we could uh, but given given the circumstances i'm honored to welcome you into this virtual virtual gathering so tanya um, is the recent uh, podcast host for Seven Truths, where she shares Nishinaabekwe wisdom with all of us. She's a storyteller, uh, the head of Makwa Creative, and uh, our honored guest tonight at Matriarch Illuminations, where mm -hmm. we're going to explore storytelling as guidance. And given, Tanya, your most recent uh, endeavors, I'm so glad to host you here today. Oh, Jessica, it's so good to see you. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I, even virtually, um, I, I, I love where you're sitting right now. 
um, in your, your beautiful home. Um, and um, I wish we were visiting over a mug of tea. I totally agree. And maybe some baked goods from your, your lovely, your lovely partner's family. <laughs> we won't get into that. <laughs> we eat well in these parts and we, we like very, to host our, our very, friends very and family well. well. Very, yeah. very well, very well. And I want to say, Buzu, Anin, Tanya, Tlaga, Nagis, Nikas, Kamusko, Pimo, Zizia, Pineshish, Nagis, Nikas. And I'm coming to you tonight from Tekaranto, um, which is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat and the Seneca people, but now home to the Mississaugas of the Credit. And this is where I, um, I live. And so um, I'm really grateful to be here. You know, um, when you said you're doing this this evening on matriarchs for the School of Public Policy and Global <laughs> Affairs, I'm like, wow, she's really <laughs> mixing it up, which is awesome because that's what you do, and you have so much power in what you do. You know, um, yeah, you're one of the strongest, strongest Quay I know. So my hands to oh, you, yeah. my friend. To the exit noon. Thank you. How many, uh, um, so I think the best way to start us off, I mean, yes, we're, we're global affairs and public policy and I'm a fellow. So, so what does that mean? I'm a policy practitioner, but the part that I thought was so interesting um, to, to dive into is matriarchy and matriarchy as teacher, matriarchy is law, matriarchy is policy, matriarchy is guidance, matriarchy is health. And recently a, a student asked me what the opposite of colonization was. And I think I said rematriation. Wow. Um, for me, hmm. yeah. So for me, um, I have to admit, I'm I'm in this awkward place where I'm trying to binge listen to your podcast because it is so nourishing and it's just like, it just tastes like more, you know, when you have something just so good, you just want to fill yourself with it and also just to savor it. And how many of those teachings there are really about how we carry ourselves in the world. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what a powerful medium that is. What made you decide to want to do a podcast? Mm. Um, Miigwech for listening and because uh, I just came out so you have to binge <laughs> I uh, appreciate that. You're probably really sick and tired of listening to my voice but yes here I, I am. <laughs> um, you know I, I wanted to, um, I was always curious about the podcast format um, as, a, as a way of telling story. I was really curious about it and um, you know, I know you and I have talked about this before, actually, on stage, like um, we were, I think, at the Broadbent Institute we, in Ottawa, and it was yourself and myself and Nahani Fontaine, and we were talking about how none of us ever really expected to be in the roles that we're in now, and that, you know, we didn't expect to be speakers. I think about that a lot, you know, because you were the one that said, it's like, somebody turned the lights on in the room and you were the one holding the baton. Like it was like a game of musical chairs or something, you know, and you're, you're the last one in the chair. So you must be it. Um, and I always felt that way about speaking and stories. I was always more comfortable with writing, which is interesting because writing is, is a little bit more quiet. It's a little bit more um, insular with speaking. You put yourself out there. But I found myself giving all of these speeches um, after Seven Fallen Feathers and All Our Relations were published. And I started to understand what it's like to be part of a crowd, you know, to be standing in front of a crowd and telling a story. And I started to think about our oral story tradition and how I really needed to lean in on, on that um, and learn more. And I was thinking a lot, I think a lot about storytelling and about that as a device because for thousands of years, you know, we didn't, we didn't write stories down. I mean, uh, my people, the Ojibwe are the people, the pictographs, like we would, you know, we had symbols that we would draw things to tell story, but it was an oral story format that told our stories, our truths for generations. And I think there's impact in that. You know, um, 
I think that that's where people can hear our voices when sometimes policy or government or laws aren't as effective. Mm -hmm. So the concept of a podcast to me was really interesting because I could bring as well community voices in to it. Um, so it wasn't just me narrating, like I frame the story in a certain way, but I bring all of these people into the story to tell the story. And that's really what our communities are all about. It's, it's about others. It's about the circle. And the podcast is kind of a good way to do that. For, for so many reasons, I find hearing the voices of people being able to speak for themselves through that podcast, the most meaningful and powerful part. There's a young man, oh, I can't remember his name. He's telling the truth and his voice is shaking. And it's all about him caring for his friends and his family and his extended family at the school to keep them safe in Thunder Bay. And I have to, I have to admit, Thunder Bay plays a, a really strong part of my internal landscape. I used to live there when I was a child, right. yeah, north of Thunder yeah. Bay. So to hear that, to hear, to hear the land in those stories, mm. um, I found really meaningful. And also that, that we don't tell our stories alone. I think that's part of that teaching is that I appreciate your print. I mean, I think this, what, four five copies I've bought of these because I <laughs> give them away and then I go and get them again, <laughs> knowing that they're only with me for a period of time. Um, but that idea is like, it's powerful and it's meaningful, but to hear folks in their own words and to be able to share that, I mean, that's the gift of storytelling is if you can share somebody's voice who may or may not be there. And I think that's what's so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on episode four on wisdom. And there are so many things resonating for me in that, in that unpacking of that teaching that are relevant to policy and practice. I mean, in our way, we have our adak, uh, our sacred laws. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, there are rules. Mm -hmm. There are rules, but there is wisdom in those rules. And all of the quotes you start off with, with Mar uh, a speech by Martin Luther King talking about racism and the function of racism mm -hmm. being genocide, mm -hmm. that that is its ultimate outcome. And you talk about it in such an acute way. And it's useful to mention that today that report came out from Dr. Mary Ellen Jupel-Lafon looking at anti-Indigenous racism mm -hmm. in BC's healthcare system. Mm -hmm. To even name it, anti-Indigenous, to name Mm -hmm. racism to name genocide part of these things in our stories and our teachings I think are so relevant to policy is that truth-telling mm -hmm. and having folks at the center of that experience be make the decisions and inform the decisions that are made for us collectively mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that peace to share knowledge is to know wisdom that elder Sam said that was the that was the quote and when I think about what we as policymakers, doers and undoers, you know, policy can hurt. Mm -hmm. 60 scoop as a policy mm -hmm. can also heal. Mm -hmm. um, how we take those stories in and allow ourselves to be humble and take those teachings in that we don't have to know, but we have to do is listen. I'm getting so much of that from your your podcast and I appreciate it so much. And I think your voice is important to actually hear it. Hmm. Well, it's, it's amazing too, that you, I appreciate that, um, that you picked up on, on that and what Sam was saying uh, about knowledge being truth. And also what Martin Luther King, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was saying too. Um, Cause I've been reading a lot, you know, um, and leaning a lot on, on actually Martin Luther King, Angela Davis, on um, black civil rights leaders. Yes. And this, yes. <laughs> you know, it's like this, the struggle is very similar. And the history of our people on Turtle Island is very similar. That history of, um, of this continent being born on violence 
you know, first it was the, um, well, attempted genocide of our people, um, policies of extermination, you know, talk about policies that can hurt. Um, think about the US President Andrew Jackson and the policies that he made to settle the land, you know, um, and the, the policies the US government had of making treaties and not respecting one single damn one of them. I was uh, US General Tecumseh Sherman said that, you know, I made 300 and some odd treaties and I haven't respected a damn one of them. Um, and then you see the same in Canada. Um, that policy was used as a tool of genocide, right? And then you see that happening to our people, but then you see slavery coming in to Turtle Island. There's more violence, right? This is a place is of, you know, we tell ourselves, or Canadians tell themselves here in Canada that we're better, we're, you know, we're softer. It's so not true. The whole continent was born of violence, right? And we're still suffering from that. Like we, we you see it everywhere, you know? Um, not to go on about it, but I'm just reading Barack Obama's book. And he talks about yeah, the new one. Yeah. Oh. You know, it's, it's fantastic. And it just like, he talks about, you know, people, especially, you know, young people being complacent, some young people, um, non-black people, white Americans thinking that, you know, racism doesn't matter, you know, and their do-gooders are feeling happy and things are going to get better. And he's like, no, race does matter. All of those speeches that you hear now of Martin Luther King talking about race, mm -hmm. all the civil rights movement activists, the same time that AIM was happening, the same time, yep. Yep. you know, and we're talking about, when we talk about reparations, when we talk about mm, mm -hmm. slavery, those were indigenous people taken from another territory and brought here. Mm -hmm. yeah. like the, the dehumanizing aspect of, of lesser than indigeneity is built so deeply ingrained into everything. Um, the policies around redlining in the States, whereas on, on reserve, you know, indigenous housing is the only housing in Canada that depreciates in value. Mm -hmm. Because we we're not, you know, our, our land is held in trust and the policies around that. I do think what you're saying though is really poignant and I, about the, the covert nature of Canadian racism you know, yeah. we, we will say, I'm sorry. It's the Canadian way is to apologize. We will say we're sorry. Yeah. That doesn't mean we'll necessarily dismantle the piece. We'll say sorry while we continue to do the same thing. And I think that's something to consider. That's right. Yeah. That's and there, right. that, that, but I think we are, we're at a pivot point because the genocide was incomplete and unsuccessful. And for me, the part that I, I so desperately want to pursue adamantly and vehemently is Indigenous excellence. And I don't mean, I, I mean in every way, art, mm -hmm. culture, mm -hmm. science, economies. Mm -hmm. We have this experience of poverty that is very new to us. Mm -hmm. We do not have a long history of intergenerational poverty. We right. come from a history of wealth and abundance and laws and sustainability. Mm -hmm. And we have this very short experience of oppression and poverty and illness. True. And I am so ready to reject it all and reclaim that thread that is still present because the genocide didn't work. We're here and reclaim that excellence, that ability to dream, not to be equal, but to excel the full embodiment of our dreams and have that be the policy goals and the goals of our laws to affirm our humanity, yeah. to affirm our stories, our place in every aspect of our lives mm -hmm. and not be small. Yeah, and not be small, no. And, you know, women playing a role in that. I'm thinking of mm -hmm. just... And, and, and I mean this, your role, I mean, thinking about how to be different, how to make a change. And you quarterbacked the UNDRIP for BC. I mean, that is huge, right? When no one else, when Canada couldn't get it done, you were there, I saw you working hard, getting it done. 
passing it, doing it. Martin Luther King said one other thing. He said, and I think about this a lot, um, he said that you can pass all the laws that you want in the world as well. But unless you have the will of the majority, the will of the people, the laws won't matter. You know, and he said that in that same speech, um, The Other America. And I think about it a lot. The Other America. Yeah. He gave it at Stanford University in 1967. Um, it was uh, the year before he was assassinated. And it's a fantastic speech. And it's a little, um, it's, it's definitely, you know, like people like the I Have a Dream Martin Luther King, but you got to listen to the rest of Martin Luther King. You know, <laughs> he's like, he's, um, he's pow, right? And he talks about that, you know, we can pass these laws, but it's not going to matter unless we have the people behind it. And that's so true. That's so, I think about that a lot, you know. Um, you know, I think about it with UNDRIP in BC. I think about it with the laws that the Trudeau government tries to pass. Um, and I think about it too with what that means, you know, and can we exist? I know you and I have talked about this before. Can we as Indigenous people exist in the British model of a parliamentary system? that we find ourselves in. I think whether or not we want to, we're here. We're here. And I have to believe in that hope piece, even if I can't see it. You, one of your guests mentioned that on the podcast. It's like turning towards the light yeah. and finding it, orienting orienting yourself to that, that even if you backslide, you are aimed at that. And I may have been a quarterback, but I was part of a very large team of people who started before I even started my professional career to be able to advance that law. Mm -hmm. And a dedicated team of public servants who have never done anything like this before in leadership, like I have never seen. And it shouldn't have to be perfect and unique it shouldn't have to be so rare I to know. find the hope and the humanity. And I so know. I don't know if the system needs to change because I know, you know, regardless of input, the output remains so consistent yeah. that it's resilient to this kind of change. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And yet I'm in it. I'm a public servant and have been on and off for most of my career of how I do believe there, you can look at it as rules or art. You can look at it as hope or restriction. And I think we miss that as policymakers and racism will adapt to be as innocuous as ever. Slavery and, and the genocide of indigenous people, of people of color, of women has been acceptable in so many different ways. It may change the tactic, but the violence remains and therefore there's something that is still acceptable. So there is something about the majority I do believe we need to, mm -hmm. to do, to change. Mm -hmm. About how folks act, how they interrupt, mm -hmm. how they isolate those dark parts of our society who are either unwilling or unable to shift their perception, their thinking, their inclusion, like how you isolate that harm and move everybody else to the left. Mm -hmm. There's storytelling. Storytelling does that. Yes. <laughs> that's right? a, you know, that's yeah. And like the fact is that you got to where you are to push on drip, you know, uh, on the shoulders of all those other people shows the matriarch that you are though, right? Like your teachings and your leadership and you're not giving up that hope. You're just going to push it through, you know? And it, but it's, we're using different tools, which is so cool, yeah. which is so cool about you putting, you know, you, your involvement, getting it together, you were using different tools, right? And you use story, you use community yes. um, because you know that people hear that. I think there's a story in the legislation and the beautiful thing about stories, that's all law is, is a story teaching mm -hmm. us how to carry ourselves, mm -hmm. is that it's going to go on, I hope, and have a long and healthy life and do work I can't even have imagined that none of us here at this time could have imagined. 
it's like that trust in what you nurture not knowing exactly what it will mean but it will have meaning and i think there's that like there's that piece like we don't i would show up my little notebook with my uh, my GE, sometimes once I even brought a tape recorder, and my grandfather and my grandmother just clammed up, like just a little crab trap, just done, until it went away, and then they would talk to me. And there's this mistrust because it becomes so static and doesn't adjust itself. That flexibility to story to where you put the emphasis depending on your audience or who's around you or which part of the story you're teaching and exploring that day. I can only imagine as a storyteller as prolific as you are, how many stories you carry that you haven't shared. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I worked on a documentary with a uh, Métis filmmaker, Christine Welsh. And, you know, to get a two hour film, two and a half hours tops, yeah. the thousands of hours of tape we had and the stories oh, yeah. that you become responsible for. And the thing she always stressed for me is that you, you prepare to receive them you and you carry those relationships on forever. Mm. Is that, that to hold that person's story, to hold that family's story, to hold the story of these women, you have a responsibility to those stories to care for them and carry them forward where they belong. Mm. Wow. I appreciate hearing that, right? Especially right now, because right now we're in, um, we're, we've just got a rough cut of our documentary done. And that's, that's, thank you. And that's the hard part is what do you do? with all this amazing material that you don't want to let go of and you, you have to take care of this beautiful, beautiful stories. And I have an hour of Cindy Blackstock talking <laughs> about um, how she got to where she is, what motivated her to do, how she sees Canada changing, what she wants to see and what her legacy will be. I, that's beautiful. And I had the same with Murray Sinclair. And I'm just thinking to myself, I have to do something because I can't, otherwise my documentary would be three hours long. <laughs> It'd be like, you know, they're just like, I could just let it, them run, just let them go. Because the, what they have to say to everybody is so powerful. So I'm just, you know, I just had to say that because while you were talking about that, about your responsibility to the story, and when you were going through your process, you've got that. And you're like, okay, what do I do with this? Like, it's important. Where, where, where do I put it? Where does it go? Mm -hmm. so we're thinking of ways you know, I, anyway long story <laughs> with there and there were so many things and it was such a different time you know we were we were working in in um a different kind of medium than the technology we have available today and that's what i think is so amazing about youth storytellers working with elders and compiling and we have these amazing devices that allow us to have what used to be just this giant beta cam or something or actual yeah. film reels yeah. and it was expensive and now it's getting cheaper and cheaper and more accessible and we have all of these mediums like we're across the country in different time zones thank you by the way <laughs> of how we're able to connect and that is a, a beautiful way to to use the tools that are out there now but it means it's so accessible and that's what i love about seeing these young storytellers just fearless yeah they're whether it's in print or spoken word or video or tiktok i'm slightly tiktok obsessed um and it just because it's so it's like high production value low time commitment yeah. And these young people are telling their truths in such funny and deep and profound and shocking ways that I feel compelled to pay attention. I feel compelled to sit with them. Um, I agree. Do you, what it reminds me of is, is a responsibility I heard to mentor when it's ready. I've greatly benefited, as I've mentioned, Christine as one of those. Uh, people, Fidelia Hayupas was another another mentor of mine when I was very young. Um, 
the role of mentorship and storytelling and how that teaching happens. And I think that's what's so amazing about um, the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs is they have me, Andrea Reimer, who will also be on a session oh, later this week, amazing. <laughs> who's on faculty here, and Cheryl Lightfoot will be joining oh, wow. uh, me both to talk about what comes next. So we have these three Indigenous women leaders at the school. Um, amazing. And what an opportunity that is for students. And, you know, you refer to your elder, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> your elder I appreciate that I have my Christine <laughs> um, as, as my mentor what kind of role has mentorship and storytelling in your work been for you mm. huge for me I mean absolutely huge to be honest with you I've, I feel really blessed um, I feel very lucky to have the people in my life that I have um, as mentors. And, you know, I don't know if they would ever say, am I a mentor? I don't know about that, but it's a hundred percent Murray Sinclair. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I wrote my second book, you know, I, I remember being in just dire straits a couple of times and he was the one that pulled me out, you know, with his words and his advice. Um, Sam, I speak to Sam every day, like every day. Um, we speak by, uh, of course, Facebook Messenger, because that's, you know, how all First Nations people speak to each it's other. It's tradition. It is tradition. It's tradition. <laughs> it's true. Everybody else can diss Facebook if they want, but we will not. We actually are all on Facebook. It's because we're still adjusting from the loss of high five. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> that's so true every day yeah yeah so i speak to him every day you speak with him every day yeah like little things um you know hi like he just sent me a note tonight like hiya and like i realized that we didn't speak this morning we always speak in the morning um always you know um and he's trying to like i i lean on him for so much i don't know if he knows that and so that's part of the first episode of the podcast with the seven grandfather teachings and the first one being love, what the importance of love is the, to me, love is um, community, love of our people, you know, holding each other close and that connection. And I think like as an Anishinaabe Kwe, that's what we believe. We believe in the continuum, the circle, you know, we're all connected or I'm connected to um, to the earth, to the sky, to the water. I'm connected to Sam. I'm connected to my people, right? That was what love is about. And that very much is even talking to Sam every day, asking how you are, or him telling me the name of the Great Lakes in Anishinaabewewin to try and bring language to me. So I always mm -hmm. feel like I'm learning. I always feel mm -hmm. like I'm learning. And I think you're right about the about how important it is for mentorship. And I try and um, I try and be involved with our youth. And sometimes it's not as often as I want. Sometimes it's more sporadic. Like um, I've been lucky enough to go hunting every September with um, the youth from Nishnabi Asky Nation or Dennis Franklin Cromarty High School. Yeah, we go moose hunting. Um, and we spend time around the campfire together. We spend time in the bush together, you know, laughing when they hear my moose call or um, just, it's really bad. <laughs> um, you know, and, and my relationship with the students at DFC and I keep trying that, you know, like it's like you heard it in this, the second episode of the podcast on bravery. That was Caden and Janicombe that um, mm -hmm. you were referring to. He's one of the students at Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School, you know, and they're important, you know, and it, it means something to connect with youth, with our youth, um, and to show that you care and not to have like a fly by night relationship where you're just sort of in there and you're out. Um, yeah it's there's it's a lifeline it's everything it right? is it is mentorship is so important. showing up 
yeah showing up yeah so my goal is i'm a in this part of my career i'm off career i'm often the first or the only indigenous woman in the room but i'm doing my damnedest to ensure i'm not the last because the thing i remember from our that i've reflected on since our first meeting the thing that has stuck with me that i realized was that it's not that we don't belong in these spaces it's that we don't belong here alone yes 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 and it's the same for students it's the same teachings we have our people aren't we don't go in alone we don't have an expert yeah exactly. that's not an expert that's right that's that's too much to put on one person we share that accountability Mm -hmm. through transparency through community mm -hmm. through participation and it's definitely something that institutions aren't good at right like we have these other things but they're all just traditions yeah yeah i mean yeah. when i to sit in the legislature and to see laws and debate and speeches it's all ceremony and that started to make sense to me. That's the only reason that the legislature makes sense to me is because I can understand ceremony. I can understand that there are rules of engagement and that there are ways to answer back. And there's ways to assert your respect and dignity. That, and I think that's why a friend, a friend of mine um, says that that's why Indigenous people always appeal to the Crown because we're the last folks who think the crown still has honor. Oh, interesting. That's why we appeal to it, because we appeal from our honor to yours. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I want to uphold that honor. I believe in it, because I want to see that reflected. I want to have that honor in myself and for whoever I sit at the table with. Mm -hmm. And so I believe it's there. I believe we all can pull on that honor. And that that is something that should globally be part of our practice. Mm -hmm. I think I was asked recently uh, about requiring, I can't remember what it was. I think it was an education requiring something. So why would we wait for a mandate? Why would we wait for direction to do the right thing? We all have a realm of accountability and influence and power right here. We are responsible to and for people all the time. Yeah. That's that the majority, to me is, right? That's, that's yeah. like what you just said. That's convincing the people that they need to have that. They've heard the story. They know the truth now. And now it's with them, it's sitting with them, and they have to take action. Because that's another thing. Um, it, you know, the Martin Luther King said, um, you can't wait on time. You can't wait for governments and you know lawmakers to make the policy you have to push it and be it was it sounds like you know it's it, but it's the truth it's the truth you know it sounds like every one of our elders i know <laughs> don't I wait know. for them i, I know it's just like, <laughs> I know. And it's, it is true that I don't wait. And, and then and he, he also said, and it's so true. He's like, you know, when they were pursuing civil rights um, legislation in the United States, he said, you know, nobody handed us any of this. And we had to fight for every single inch. And I think about that a lot here with us, with our First Nations in all of the things that we're doing, you know, the Mi'kmaq, mm. fishing right. Can we just take a moment for the Mi'kmaq? Take a moment. Can for we just take a moment? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Can we just take a moment to acknowledge, like people do not think of indigenous people. Nobody suspected the Mi'kmaq of being a financial powerhouse. That's right. And Unity. buying the company i know who, I know. who now signs the checks I and know. who has kept receipts they have kept receipts that's right and i'm just like like you just bypass the whole fight you just bypass the whole there's no scrimmage you don't engage can we just take a moment for the mi'kmaq and how inspiring and how many like 
How many matriarchs just went, mm-hmm? <laughs> mm -hmm. I know. It's, it's true. <laughs> that was the happiest day. That was the happiest day. <laughs> what there. a switch, right? Yeah, I think everyone was so happy. Hearts broken, open, yeah. solidarity, crying to like, what? Just yeah. take it back. Yeah, yeah. It was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Amazing. Yeah, that's the stuff of legend right there. It is, it is. You know, and there's lessons for that too in all of, all of the fights that are going on, you know. Um, 1492 land back you know it's amazing what's going on there as well i mean this is the proclamate the how Hal demand proclamation was signed in 1784 you know a gift of this land to the haudenosaunee people for their part in the american revolution for siding with the british and still they're fighting Haudenosaunee are fighting. It's the same. It's the same, mm. you know, over and over again. That same struggle to find equity and to, a, a, to listen to the laws of the land, which are the treaties, you know? For us, out here, this way. Some of our people, you know, Nishka. <laughs> There's also... <laughs> But there's so many ways to find that resolution for nations ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the, the homogenization of the approach is what really gets us into trouble. Uh, you yeah. know, the, the danger of the single story, as they say. Yeah. I for think sure. I'm, I'm seeing flashing. Oh, they're flashing. <laughs> I think this is flashing at us? They're, we're people are flashing at us that we're getting carried that away. <laughs> That's so okay, funny. Okay, so there is, there is a Q&A. Um, and I think we're at time where we can take some questions. Are you, are you open and ready for that? I am, but before we do that, I have to, I have to say two hellos. Did you say Andrea Reimer is here? Is she here? Is she yes. on this call? She, she's uh, on the participants and she'll be coming back as a guest on Thursday. Oh, okay. All right. I love her. I love Andrea and my friend. She's oh, here. <laughs> it's good to see you, Andrea. Um, and um, also Leslie Bonshore. Yes. Hello. Yes, to, hello, hello, it's good to see you too. Isn't that great to know, like those are two people on the West Coast, I have to say, that make me feel very sure that I'm not alone. Andrea Reimer was the first fellow in the school and was a big part of recruiting me to take on this role. Um, so talk about, you know, matriarchs uplifting oh. each other. Those are two, those are two amazing matriarchs uh, for me too. The first time I heard Andrea Reimer speak, I almost fell over. Her, her the power of her story is incredible and listening to all the things she's done and accomplished and just from sheer will. I mean, she's, oh, this is my dog. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm amazed. And Leslie Bonshore, same thing. She sent me the most beautiful email basically saying, hi, we need to know each other. And so when you come on the West Coast, um, we have to have coffee. It was after I'd written Seven Fallen Feathers. I'll never forget that. And I remember reading this email from her and, um, you know, thinking, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have coffee. I have a really good feeling about, about Leslie. And so we had coffee. And that meeting was so integral. She, she was a huge help, huge help to me uh, in writing all our relations. Just saying. Well, I love that two of the pillars in your world or two of the pillars. <laughs> I cool. feel like that's just what's going to happen, right? Yeah. That's just what's going to happen. Um, so having said that, I should, um, let's see, I'll come to questions. The first one, it, I think Tasha, do you want to call us in or can I, can I pull up the first one? I think I'm just going to try the first one and then interject if, you're, <laughs> if we had another system here. No, I think is this go ahead. Oh, I was just saying, go ahead. I think the that's a, the idea. Okay, thank you. Um, so an anonymous question is the system resilient to stories? What kinds what kinds of stories and what forms of storytelling is the system not yet resilient to? Hmm. 
Hmm. Well, here's, here's the thing. I, I think today's example of the immense truth that Dr. Mary Ellen Trapelafond and her team as, of investigators and all the Indigenous people who spoke when we speak our truth together, the strength in our numbers is pretty powerful. The system cannot resist responding to that. And there's also the will in government to do so. Um, but the ability to look at the truth, I think, is something that cannot be, cannot, sometimes the truths are just so self-evident that you can't undo them by any type of system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's true. You know, Thomas King, um, he said, you know, um, in his Massey lectures, and he said that, uh, you know, now that you've heard the story, it's yours to take it forward, you know, you've heard the story, you can't turn away, right? Um, mm -hmm. And you can't, but those ears have to be open and willing to, to listen. Sometimes they're not, you know, like how many reports do we need as well to talk about racism in healthcare and in, you know, it's awful. How many mm -hmm. inquiries and inquests, um, investigations must we go through to know the truths that we know? Um, when do the other people hear? I, I, I agree with you. I think that people are starting to listen a lot more now than they ever were. And that's because of the rise of all of our voices, because of social mm -hmm. media, because of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission five years ago, releasing their report and Canada not being able to turn away. They had to know the truth, you know? Um, and that's the hard part, right? It's the truth. But it's so, it's, you can't turn away from, you can't turn away from those truths. We have in this country, there's been a history of that, but I, I think that, I hope that that's coming to an end. I really do. Well, we get to tell our own stories now. And I think the truth in using our own stories and our own voice and our own methodologies and validating ourselves and not in comparison to someone or something else or another culture, I think that is powerful because constantly having to explain or prove our existence or our experience or mm -hmm. our lived experience, that is an incredible amount of energy mm -hmm. than just speaking our truth and, and however it serves us, mm -hmm. put it in writing, have 30,000 applicants for residential school settlement, not even the TRC hearings, the ones before that. Yeah. I mean, this, this, those survivors who got the class act, the largest class action suit in Canadian history and the only reconciliation process that was court mandated. That is a gift to us that they were brave enough to tell the truth for so long and then to collectively tell the truth and share that truth with us holds us accountable. Yes, so true. That is so true. Yeah. Um, here's one. I often feel that there's a lack of storytelling in university teaching, particularly by non-Indigenous lecturers how to show people who hold these positions of power influencing young people to hold greater value to learning via storytelling. Hmm. Mm. That'd probably be a good one for you, Jessica, because you're writing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I'm doing these sessions, to be honest. Mm. I could lecture, I could do case studies. But what's interesting for me is the teaching of dialogue, is to share this space with somebody else and amplify those truths and, and test them with yeah. somebody else, our own, for lack of a better word, uh, ancestral monitoring, our empirical data that we're sharing. This is how I, and how I choose to see that truth because I could be focused on the oppression as if that is the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. I could be focused on the resilience and the hope, yeah. which is really the longer story. It is. It is. Yeah. 
So I would encourage any of the professors or people listening, whether you're public servants, government elected teachers, to invite story to people to speak for themselves into your classrooms and into your methodologies. Um, it's something that Linda Tuhiwe Smith wrote about over 15 years ago in Decolonizing Methodologies. It mm -hmm. is a valid and, and important practice and something that I'm championing and it, it teaches me and it fills me. Mm -hmm. um, and as much as a law or, or a plan or a strategy. I'm a policy wonk. I don't apologize for that. Um, but I think there's power in it. And I think that's, that's where it can come in. Um, here's one for you, Tanya. Can you talk a little bit about your experience in journalism? As many companies or papers do not properly report, if at all, in Indigenous communities, um, both Indigenous excellence and issues. Mm, uh, I mean, <laughs> there's, a, there's one for Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> No, did you like how I successfully kicked that other one to you? And now this one's coming right back to me. I know. Um, we need to hire um, more of our voices in the mainstream, you know. Um, but we're, we're going beyond mainstream, you know. We're finding our own ways to tell our own stories. And that's to me, is really, really cool. Because for such a long time, you know, we've been there we've had stories to tell and no one's really you know um the people in charge of the newspapers and the tv stations they haven't want to hear them as much right um they're like oh not that story again not the story about the drunken indians again or the chief that rips off uh, everyone in his nation again um you know i heard that a, a lot the um, alley diary <laughs> yeah yeah right like you know you hear that you hear those things a lot and um there's only so much you can take of that right and just like um yeah there's an old school way of thinking that's difficult you know like when i was doing um when i was reporting on um murdered missing indigenous women and girls and i was at the um, um the closing ceremony which was such an amazing, beautiful ceremony. So many of us had gathered in Gatineau, Quebec, and I'd been at the opening ceremony. And so then I was there at the closing ceremony. All 11 Indigenous senators were there. Um, so many families that we, um, that I knew from, for over years, they were there, the parents were there. Um, it was such an incredible day of hope and love and grief. And then this report came out and it was so incredible and beautiful and strong. And Marion Bullard just hit it out of the park when she said that this is genocide. And I remember being in the scrum afterwards of all the other mainstream reporters and listening to her say that, and everyone just attacked. How do you know that's genocide? How can you say that? It was this negativity right off the bat and a disbelief. It's like, silly silly woman no that's not true. you know you've got this wrong that's what it was like at the time and hearing your colleagues too like there was <gasps> the only person else you know there was aptn was there myself and jorge barrera and but you know and but hearing all my colleagues in ottawa like just pounced on that because that was the mainstream thinking that's you know, that's not genocide. They are wrong. This is, there's no genocide here. Genocide is Holocaust. Genocide is something very different. Um, it was just a gut punch. This is a very long answer to, um, cause then you saw the coverage and news coverage was all focused on that right afterwards. Um, editorials were written. It was, it was horrible, you know, um, and so I think about that a lot. And I think of the strides that we're making, you know, about telling our own stories now, um, about more of us in decision-making roles, and that's where we need to be. It's not good enough to have an editor and a journalist who's Indigenous. You need someone who's running the show to be Indigenous, you know. You need someone on the board to be Indigenous, making decisions, pulling the levers of power, not just the ones that are down here, but the ones up here that really, really matter and count. Um, 
because there aren't a lot of our faces up there. I hope that's going to no, change. There's not, and and maybe more than one board member. I know, yeah, so exactly. that we're not alone. But we're I know, board. Exactly, so you're not by yourself all the time. You know, let's, that's let's go for that excellence piece. Exactly. We're not a full board. Exactly. We're not a full board. Yeah, exactly. But social media, um, it's it's so right. Like, can amplify our voices, so we don't need mainstream as much. Oh. So there's a question here. Oh, go, like go. We're at the end of our time. Do you guys uh, have time for one more? Uh, as it's really mm. six o'clock. Sure, I think so. I, Jessica, do you like? I have my dog so far is is still okay. He hasn't started to yell. <laughs> he will in a minute. But it's like... <laughs> oh, let's see. Yes, yes. I think, I think the question, it's, there's too many there. So I didn't tell you before, but there's like 200 people on this. <laughs> oh, you didn't tell me that. Oh, I know. <laughs> so <much of> it. <laughs> you my oh my God. <laughs> Put on some lipstick, something. Oh, you're wearing your earrings. That's all that counts. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Um, I think a lot of people were very curious of how they could uh, tune into your podcast. Oh, Ooh. yeah, my podcast. Um, uh, it's uh, I don't know if you guys all see this. Uh, it's uh, audible.ca. So um, there we go. Yeah. So you just have to go to audible.ca and it's actually free right now. So if you sign up, I know you have to sign up, sign up though, and you can sign up if free for a month. So you've got a month to listen to it and then you can just unsign <laughs> if you want to, or you can keep listening to audible, um, which I hope you do. But uh, you yeah. have other books on audible too, though. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to that's like that. And you know, what an Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, I have to, I do have to say um, that Audible like gave me totally full creative license. It was amazing. They basically said, go make a podcast, go do it. And so I did. And they, they, so that's, it was, that was something. Fantastic. I want to thank Shut. you so much. Um, sorry, Jessica, did you have a, something to yeah. add? Yeah. What I'll say is thank you. Um, Tanya for joining me tonight for being part of Matriarch Illuminations. It's been absolutely fantastic. I also um, want to thank you for the work that you're doing and that you will continue to do and for sharing our stories and our voices out in such powerful ways. Mm -hmm. And you're so humble and so generous mm -hmm. and um, such a powerful storyteller that appreciate your time. Um, and I will invite you to join us uh, this coming week. We will be uh, meeting with Marianne Trapelafond on Wednesday and with uh, Cheryl Lightfoot and Andrea Reimer on Thursday with the UBC School, um, where we'll talk about what's next. We'll be talking about law with Mary Ellen and we'll be talking about where the world goes from here afterwards. Um, wow. Yeah, I hope you'll join us. And if not, they will be available by recording and Tina, I can't wait to hear, I can't wait to see your documentary. I just can't wait. Oh, make, make rich, make rich. And uh, I appreciate the time that everyone spent with us tonight. Um, and it, Jessica and I are friends, you probably realize that. <laughs> and so it, it, it did feel like we were just having a nice uh, chat, uh, felt like we were having tea together. So I know we will again soon. Yeah, with Andrea and also with Leslie. <laughs> Yes, and thank you to Tasha for keeping us on schedule and Tina, Alexander, Lindsay Marsh, Tamara Baldwin and Alex and McFarland and Women in Policy for hosting us. And most of all, for our ancestors for helping us all gather tonight. Hamia. Yeah.